Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Centuries before mega churches were built in the suburbs and introduced huge electric signs, churches attracted attention with cross top steeples and bells. The taller the steeple, the better. The louder the bell, the better. So once upon a time, there was a village church with a steeple that could be seen for miles around. It was perfect, except for one thing. The bell wouldn't ring. Church leaders invited people from all around to try their hands at remedying the problem, but to no avail. One day, a small fellow came to the church and announced to the pastor, I can make the bell ring. The pastor said, okay, try it. So the man climbed up to the base of the belfry in the steeple, took three steps back, and then ran into the bell with his face. Bong! The bell rang, and he was hired on the spot. One windy Sunday, as the man ran toward the bell to ring it, the wind moved it, causing the bell ringer to fall out of the steeple and onto the ground below. As the crowd gathered, the pastor asked, Does anyone know this fellow's name? Just then a woman bent low to look at him and then replied, I don't know his name, but his face sure rings a bell. The things Paul writes about here sure ring a bell. They ring true for us as much as when, he, when Paul wrote them to Titus. And that's the case with the Word of God. God's Word is timeless, it's true, and it's relevant always. We are confronted with unruly deceivers, empty talkers, who are only interested in money today too. False teachings and false teachers has been and always will be a threat to the church. It was in Paul's day and it continues to be our challenge today. The realm of truth is not a playground. It's a battleground. It takes courage. It takes the strength of God to stand. Wherever God sows the truth, Satan quickly shows up to sow lies. We have an aggressive adversary who attacks the truth, who attacks the church, and he seeks to subtly lead people away from the all-sufficiency of Christ. Satan is he's the master of deception, and he uses people who lack truth but are intelligent and know how to win friends and influence people. And they move among the church, seeking to cause people to, to turn their eyes off of Christ and on to that person and on to some new teaching or an old teaching with new packaging. But a trained eye can spot them. And Paul's instruction here to Titus tells us what clues to look for so we will not be led astray from Christ or his message of grace for today. Titus 1.10 says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. The word for links verse 10 to verse 9 before it. And we find that the reason elders and leaders in the church need to be men of the word, holding fast to the faithful word, is because there are many who do not. Because there are many false teachers and teachings out there. Paul has nothing good to say here about false teachers. He states there are three most prominent characteristics. That they are unruly, vain talkers, and deceivers. The word unruly speaks of a rebellious person. Uh, literally an unaccountable person. Those whom Paul speaks of in Crete refuse to submit themselves to any oversight or to be accountable to anyone, not willing to put themselves under anyone's authority. That's something to watch for in the church. Men who teach and preach and who might go all over the country doing it, but they have no accountability to a ministry. False teachers oftentimes establish themselves as the authority. This is often fueled by the adoration and devotion of undiscerning followers. Spiritual teachers are dangerous when they set themselves up as the sole source and authority of spiritual truth for their followers, even not permitting or recommending that they listen 
to anyone else teach. We should beware of teachers who give themselves titles of spiritual leadership but are accountable to no one, uh, to no one who could remove that title or their position should they fail to honor uh, that position according to God's word. Even the Apostle Paul was accountable to the church at Antioch who sent him out on his missionary journeys. In Acts, we see how he would return to give reports of his missionary journeys to that church. No one and no spiritual leader outgrows the need for accountability in the Lord's work. So we should beware of teachers who will not put themselves under authority. The second thing we should watch for is vain talkers, which speaks of being empty talker. J. Vernon McGee refers to them as empty chatterers. They talk and they talk and they're good at talking, but they don't really say anything. They excel in talking, but not doing. Vain talkers speak with smoothness. They're captivating, persuasive, eloquent, and they have little or nothing on which to base their teaching. And they're literally full of hot air. What they say impresses, but it has no real content or substance. And they clearly present personal opinion as truth. It's been said you can always spot those who don't teach the truth by the way they say absolutely nothing beautifully. There's a character in Pilgrim's Progress called Talkative. Christian and faithful were walking along and Talkative comes up and engages them in dialogue. His conversation is wide and it's varied and even seems to show that he had considerable knowledge of the Bible. Faithful's enjoying the conversation but notices that Christian is quiet and walking several feet away. While Faithful likes Talkative, Christian is more perceptive and says, this with whom you're so impressed will beguile with his tongue 20 people who don't know him. He says that Talkative is from his town and has a reputation for being all talk, but very rude and ugly in his behavior, telling Faithful that everything he has lies in his tongue and making a noise with it is his religion. Faithful eventually sees that Talkative is full of words, but empty in his heart. Christian advises Faithful to begin a serious discussion about the saving grace of God. Sure enough, when Faithful does, Talkative doesn't want to talk about the truth, God's grace, or what's really important, and he says goodbye. There are many false teachers who may be likable, but they're all talk, full of words, empty in their hearts, spiritually empty of the grace of God and His truth. And their words and their talk are deceptive and they are dangerous. And Paul says these false teachers are deceivers. They deceive others because they themselves are deceived by the deceiver, Satan. Deceivers is not the common Greek word for deceivers that you normally find in the Bible. It's actually a compound word meaning mind deceivers or mind misleaders. The battle for the truth is a battle for the mind. And deceivers seek the mind, and they engage in mind deception, mind control, they play mind games. They put people under bondage and make them live in fear and worry. They pass their air off as divine truth, and they'll often deceptively couch their teaching in spiritual terms, or in language that many might recognize from Sunday school. So their error is cleverly disguised. They may even use the Bible to prove a point. They twist scriptures or divorce verses from their context or divorce them from their dispensational context to teach what they want rather than what the Bible actually says. All this reminds us that in order to protect ourselves from deception, we need to know the Word, and we need to know it very well. Tony Evans writes, Duck hunters use decoys. Today, these decoys have gotten pretty fancy. The decoys quack like ducks, move like ducks, look like ducks, and act like ducks. In fact, he says the ducks think that they are ducks, and the real ducks end up being dead ducks because they can't tell what's a real duck. There are many decoys out there, and they move people away from faith in Christ. We must not focus on the person or on how they speak or perform, but on the truth. We must be on guard for decoys moving all around us, talking like the real thing, looking like the real thing, acting like the real thing in order to deceive or to gain a following or to gain money or spiritually speaking, we'll end up as dead ducks. 
The threat to the churches on Crete came especially, Paul says, from the circumcision a title which is assigned to the Jewish people. And here's Paul's talking about Judaizers who were requiring the law to be saved and to live by. The law was once the truth of God, but now it turns people from the truth of grace. If you obeyed the law when it was part of God's program, you obeyed the truth. But when the Galatians turned from the grace of God back to the law, Paul asked them what hindered them that you should not obey the truth. Jewish teachers in Crete were imposing Judaism and the law on others and teaching Jewish traditions and legalism, requiring the law and circumcision to be saved rather than salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ. And even still today, false teachers will say that Christ is not enough. The danger of religion, works, law, legalism is still prevalent today still required by those who teach false, unsound doctrine and seek to put people in bondage. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Daily Transformation is a paperback 412-page book written by Pastor John Fredrickson. We welcome you as you journey with us through the pages of this devotional to not only learn information, but to benefit from examples of faith and failure and seek to apply God's Word to everyday life. Together, let's transition from only studying theories of doctrine to applying God's truths in a practical way. May God use these studies to help you find daily transformation. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, the Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Titus 1.11 reads, Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Paul says false teachers' mouths must be stopped. They should be silenced, in other words. The word actually means to muzzle or to gag. Paul's mandate to Titus could not have been more plain. Titus needed to silence them. The job of Titus, it wasn't to debate or discuss. It was to make them stop. In our time of religious tolerance, this doesn't sound tolerant, but it's necessary. And it's for the good of God's people and the lost. Titus needed to protect the Lord's people from the lies that they were hearing and being exposed to and to prevent the false teachers from spreading deceptive, harmful doctrines among the local churches in Crete. These false teachers, Paul says, they subvert whole houses. That word subvert is from the word used to describe what the Lord did when he went into the temple and overthrew and overturned the tables of the money changers. The faith of whole houses, the whole of whole families were being turned upside down and overthrown by unhealthy false doctrine. False teachers often will go family to family, house to house. False teachers seek out people who don't know their Bibles very well, who have little or no involvement in a church, and they seek to draw them into their web of deception. Sometimes home Bible studies are what these teachers look for and even will plant themselves or their people in to come in and introduce uh, their unsound doctrine. And all this, the deception, empty talk, the subverting and overthrowing the faith of whole houses and families, teaching things which they ought not, it's all done Paul says, for filthy lucre's sake, for sordid gain, for dishonest financial gain. 
Most false teachers do what they do for money. They have evil, selfish motives. They prey on people searching for the truth. People are trying to fill the emptiness of their hearts. They prey on hurting people who need the Lord. And their actions, according to what God says through Paul in verse 16, are abominable, detestable, disgusting. As God sees it, so we should see it. And we should be rightly disgusted with the character and detest the conduct of false teachers who prey on the needy. False teachers often try to conceal their real motives, but they want people's money. And many, sadly, use religion to fill their pockets. The following is called the Creed of the Greedy Preacher. The loot is my shepherd, I shall not work. It maketh me to lie in green pastures. It leadeth me beside the Riviera waters. It restoreth my bank balance. It leadeth me in the paths of crookedness for my fame's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of debt, I will fear no evil, for my donors and contributors are with me. My Rolexes and fundraising staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me at a ritzy restaurant in the presence of my executives. Thou anointest my head with hair gloss. My cup of cash runneth over. Surely expensive goodies in my Mercedes shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in my mansions with its tennis court forever and ever. Some of these preachers and teachers justify their luxurious lifestyles by claiming, I teach prosperity and I live prosperity. And they'll even adopt the spirit of entitlement and demand financial support, or they'll promise the blessing of God on people's lives to get their money. Not given to filthy lucre is a requirement for an elder and leader of the church. A true servant of God does not minister for personal gain. He ministers like Christ with others' highest good at heart. He ministers to reach the lost for Christ. He ministers to help others grow in their faith. Titus chapter 1, verses 12 to 13 read, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Paul quotes a prophet of their own or a philosopher of Crete by the name of Epimenides who lived around 600 B.C. This pagan poet, referring to his own people, said that the Cretans were always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies or lazy gluttons. And then Paul said that this pagan poet's words were true. Paul uses here a cultural inside joke, as it were, to make a point about the conduct of false teachers on Crete. That they were just like that. They didn't just lie some of the time. They were always liars. They weren't just beasts. They were evil beasts. They weren't just gluttons. They were lazy gluttons. They were dangerous, predatory animals, preying on the vulnerable, lying in wait to deceive for gain so that they could live lazy, gluttonous lifestyles. Evil beast was used to describe the venomous viper that latched on to Paul's hand in Malta in Acts 28.4. And so false teachers are like a dangerous viper who often strike unexpectedly and their teachings are venomous, evil, and harmful. The stakes are very high in the church and with spiritual matters. With spiritual truth and spiritual error, we're talking about people's eternal destinies and what people believe to be saved from the lake of fire. We're talking about believers being led away from the truth of Christ and from the grace of God to living by religious rules, man-made traditions, and satanic error. Therefore, Paul's instructions here, they're not mellow or laid back. For the sake of the church, for the sake of the lost, Paul instructs Titus to stop the mouths of false teachers. And here he says, Rebuke them, not softly. He says, rebuke them sharply. To rebuke them sharply is a term that comes from a compound Greek word that means to cut with an axe. It indicated a cut that took place with penetrating force. This was not something that was to be taken lightly by Titus. Titus wasn't told to give the opposing view equal time or let them have their say. They were to be confronted rebuked sharply and silenced in order to protect the saints. 
The false teachers needed to be dealt with firmly with the penetrating force of the Word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword and pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4.12 says. The rebuke should be prompt and forthright, but it's not for the purpose of being vindictive. The goal and motivation of the rebuke is restoration. Paul tells Titus to rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith, so that they may see the error of their ways and the error of their beliefs, be rescued out of them, and become sound spiritually, according to the faith of Paul's gospel for today. Titus chapter 1, verses 14 to 16 says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Paul tells Titus in verse 14 to not give heed, to pay no attention, to not give any credence to Jewish fables or myths or to the commandments of men that do nothing but turn people away from the truth of God's Word. Most of us are familiar with Greek mythology. We know the names such as Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite and Hercules. The Jews had ancient myths and folklore as well, very, very loosely based on Israel's history and even scripture. Many became preoccupied with legend rather than truth on Crete. And Paul says, Titus, that they should not be giving these fables the time of day because they lead people away from Christ. Jewish myths and fables were circulating on the island of Crete. And today we are bombarded by fictional stories and fables regarding spiritual things that are told in books, that are told in movies and documentaries and websites, which cause people to turn from the truth of Scripture. The problem of spiritual fables and myths is still with us today, and it is still something Satan uses to turn people from the truth. So this is something we need to be cautious with in the Christian life, that we don't allow fables or fictional stories about spiritual things to confuse us or to lead us away from the truth of God's Word. We're to be holding fast to the faithful Word. Paul writes, Under the pure, all things are pure. Now this statement should never be applied to things we know are evil, which unfortunately has been done before. It needs to be understood in its context. And in the context, Paul says this in regards to the commandments of men. The law teachers in Crete were telling believers that the law said certain meats were unclean or impure. So Paul responded by saying that to the pure, to save people under grace, believers, people like the believers in the churches in Crete, all things are pure. Some were imagining, as they do today, that they were somehow pure because of their traditional external religious observances and rules regarding food and drink and fastings and washings and so on. Some were promoting a life of legalism, strict abstinence from all that they considered impure by their own ideas, commandments, and traditions, too. Paul says that to those who are pure in Christ by faith, all things are pure. External legalistic restrictions make no difference as to our salvation and our purity in Christ. We are pure in Him. We can't be made purer than we are in Christ. And there is liberty under grace with the food we eat. It's all pure. As the principle of 1 Corinthians 8, 8 says, But meat, or food, commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But to, one, to, to the one who is internally impure, without Christ, defiled and unbelieving. They corrupt everything they touch, and they will not be made pure before God by any restrictions that they might put on themselves and their religious ideas. Being impure, the minds and consciences of the false teachers in Crete were defiled and corrupt, so their thinking was all wrong. And so the people in Crete and Titus are being shown that they shouldn't trust the things that these people teach or command 
that people should do or shouldn't do or, or believe. And even though these false teachers profess that they know God, even though they could talk the spiritual talk, their corrupt actions, Paul says, evidence their true natures than the impurity of their heart, that they deny God, that they do not belong to Him. The ungodly works and life of false teachers betray that they merely profess to understand spiritual truths, but they do not possess the truth that they claim. And they are actually, Paul says, abominable, detestable, disobedient, unfit, and disqualified for any good work. When you look at this passage, you see how God wants the opposite from us in much of what we see in it. Transformation for our lives is often the exact opposite of what we see in life and how we might have been in our past. Well, we see examples of around us in life of those who are unruly. Being transformed by grace, God would have us accountable and submissive to Him and to His Word. While we know that there are vain, empty talkers in life, as we are transformed by grace, God wants our speech to be full of God's words, His teaching, things that are important, things of substance and meaning for our speech to be gracious and encouraging to others. There are deceivers and liars in this world, but living a transformed life, we are to be people of the truth. And we're not to be lazy gluttons, we're to be hard workers for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not to be like many who believe spiritual fables and fictional stories. As we are transformed by grace, we are to be people of faith in the Word of God, rightly divided. We don't follow the commandments of men. We follow our Savior according to His heavenly ministry and by His message of grace for today. We don't just profess that we know God. We know God through a personal relationship with Him and through His Word. We are not unto every good work reprobate or unfit or disqualified. Having trusted, having trusted Christ as our Savior, we are qualified by God to be people of good works. And so our transformed lives, as the book of Titus challenges us, we should be full of good works, full of service and labor for the honor and glory of our God and our Savior. Thank you for watching this episode of Transformed by Grace. Next time, we're going to continue our walk through the book of Titus. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www. BereanBibleSociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750 or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society P.O. Box 756 Germantown, Wisconsin 53022 Now until next time may you be transformed by God's grace <laughs>